Thanks for coming to my talk. Um, so my name is Jimmy. Um, I work in a company called Eat More Pixels. This is literally the entire company. Uh, there's me and Zach. Uh, that's not a photo of us working. Zach's just showing me his favorite game on his phone. So uh, what is this talk about? Um, so we recently launched an app called Roundtrip. Um, it is an officially recognized digital logbook app uh, for New South Wales learner. So we're hoping to share some of the lessons that we learned from launching an app. And hopefully through this presentation, um, we can highlight some of the challenges that we face and potentially uh, some of you may also encounter as well when you are trying to launch new apps. So a brief introduction to uh, Roundtrip. So Roundtrip is designed to be a digital replacement for the good old physical um, logbook that a lot of uh, learner drivers still uses today. Um, so it's designed to make the whole um, act of recording, uh, recording your trip, your practice, uh, really easy and really simple. So the idea is, um, as the learner jump into the car, they can start the recording in the app and um, either put the phone away or pass it to their supervisor and then start driving around. And when they finish the drive, they can hit stop recording and the app through uh, all the sensors and all the services that we use will try and uh, pre-populate uh, all the details that it can figure out about the trip. So it includes details like uh, the weather during the drive, where you're driving to, where you're driving from, the amount of daytime and nighttime driving that you did. Um, so all in all, it's designed to make that uh, whole experience of recording your trip uh, really simple and really easy. Uh, so how did we really get into developing this? All right, so our journey uh, begins in Sydney, even though we are a Brisbane-based company. So we put our name um, into a pitch, uh, which is organized by uh, Transport for New South Wales. Um, it's the transport department. Uh, so they have this digital logbook innovation challenge. And uh, we were lucky enough to be one of the four winning teams from the, from the pitch. And so that uh, allowed us to get into the incubation program, which lasted about 10 months. It gave us a little bit of uh, seeding money to allow us to develop the app and also to in integrate it uh, into or integrate it with um, APIs provided by uh, the transport department. And at the end of that, uh, we get rolled into a big marketing push uh, provided by the department, uh, includes a uh, being featured in uh, channel, channel 7 news segment, which is really good for a small company like us. So, uh, firstly, I want to share some lessons that we learned during the incubation program. Um, so the first lesson uh, is about external dependencies. Right? Uh, as we start building uh, more and more complex applications, um, I'm sure a lot of you are aware you use CocoaPods or Carthage, or you depend on a lot of external APIs. So in our app, we uh, have we depended on a license verification API provided by the transport department. Um, and as I'm sure some of you have uh, experienced, the thing with external API or external dependency, you, if you're lucky, you get some kind of you know, specification or documentation, right? And so in, in the best case scenario, you, you, know, uh, you do a request and it gives you a response back and everything is well and good. So in our situation, it would be if you give it a valid license detail, it would give you a response saying that the license is actually valid. Sometimes though, it would give you an incorrect response. So in our case, it would be you give it, you give it a, a valid license, um, it would tell you that the license is invalid. Or even worse, Sometimes the API just decided to give you garbage response, so responses that are, inc uh, are invalid. So you get, so if you're expecting some kind of JSON formatted response, you may get like a garbage piece of string or sometimes a number. Um, or sometimes the API just decided to go on a holiday and you make a request, you just get nothing back, you hear nothing back from them. Right, so 
Uh, this really gave us a lot of pain and grief during the whole de uh, development process. Um, so what we've learned during this process is um, if your app has a lot of external dependencies, uh, make sure you, you go through all of them. Well, firstly, work out do you really need them? If you do, make sure your app handles them um, properly. So, uh, and by that, I mean when it's working according to spec, if you have any spec. Um, and also try and sort of be defensive in your development and protect your app so that when the dependencies is not working according to spec, you're able to fail gracefully. So test your app when, uh, against when the dependencies are down, you want to handle when the dependencies are not working correctly, like when it's giving you something you're not expect expecting it to. Uh, and lastly, also keeping the users informed when these services that they uh, may be relying on indirectly are unavailable. So in our situation, uh, sometimes when the service is uh, it's out, when it has a planned outage or unplanned outage, we show a uh, notification banner on top just to tell them, hey, you can't really submit your logbook data um, because we can't get through to the server. Um, so the second lesson uh, is about app security. So uh, when we're developing our app, a lot of the times we, uh, we, take, we take a lot of things for granted. So this is something that our eyes suddenly took for granted is when um, we were developing Roundtrip, uh, the app, as it, as it does, it, it creates a whole bunch of user data. Um, it stores it inside the app container, right? And um, also, iOS has this amazing security sort of architecture. All your data is protected in the app container. Uh, it's not accessible by other apps. Uh, so it's kind of safe. Um, so this is, this is all well and good. And we've, we've, I just kind of keep rolling, keep developing, um, until transport department decided to do a, a pen test on all the, all the apps. So uh, a, a pen test or penetration testing is where um, you, know, uh, you arrange for sometimes external, sometimes internal security um, expert to try and uh, attack your app or do a security review on the app in order to find out all the possible ways that the app could be compromised. Um, usually it'll give you a, a whole report um, just so you're aware of all the risk and how likely these, these um, threats are going to happen. And the first thing that they, uh, they did when they're doing testing on our app is they completely break my assumption of the app container, right? So they install our app on a jailbroken iPhone. And so what it allows them to do is um, all the files that we, we've been um, saving into locally are accessible and, and they, it can be modified um, very easily by the user. And so that, that's, uh, that's really bad for us because it means that now a user can uh, really easily go in, add a whole bunch of hours to their logbook, um, you know, and, and finish uh, doing their, uh, their, all their practice drive. And so we don't want that. Transport department doesn't want that. And so uh, what we end up having to do is to add encryption to the files so that even if these files are uh, accessible by the user, they can't read it or they can't change it, can't tamper with it very easily. Um, app security is kind of uh, a weird one because it, it kind of forces you to put on a different hat when you're developing your app. So it's kind of, you have to think about it from uh, the attacker's point of view or the user's point of view. Like how, um, how does attacking the app or how does the compromise app kind of benefits the attacker? Um, so uh, just, some, just something that we learned throughout the process is, you know, one thing is think about, um, is your app going to be affected if the user is running your app on a jailbroken device and hence everything on the file system is accessible by the user? Uh, and you want to think about all the potential threats um, that it could happen to your app. And this is really important as well and make the assumption that your app will be compromised, right? And based on that assumption, try to minimize the, the damage that a single attacker could do to your entire system. Um, security expert will tell you there's, there's nothing like 100% secure 
system. So you really want to balance your, the effort that you spend in uh, securing your app and the actual value of your data. So if your app, uh, if you're making, I don't know, like a, secure, uh, a calculator app or utility app where the, the value of the, the data that you handle is, isn't very important or it's not, very, uh, it's not of high value, then maybe you don't have to spend too much time thinking about security but if you're handling, say, people's personal details or their financial details, that's when you really have to spend uh, a lot, a lot more effort on securing your app. Um, so if you're really interested in exploring more along uh, app security, there's a few uh, easy tools to get you started. So the first one is uh, doing a string dump. So pretty much uh, pre-install on all our Macs, there's, a, there's an app or there's an application called Strings. So if you run strings on the um, binary that gets created inside your app IPA file, so you gotta you know, ch um, go into the package content and then you do a string dump on the binary executable, it would give you, uh, it would search through your binary and generate a list of all the constant strings you have in your app. And so this is, this is a really cool tool because it gives you, uh, it lets you see all the strings you've used in the app. And, if you if you have any if you're storing any sort of API key, uh, any kind of password in the app, this is a really easy tool to expose that, and so a, a user can potentially download an uh, an IPA and the your app the IPA file from App Store, and then sort of run string dump to find out uh, all these in, important information. So knowing that, um, my advice is sort of trying to minimize the damage someone could do assuming that they get hold of these information, right? So um, have access control in your server, uh, make sure that even if they know these keys, there's, there's little to nothing that they could do with this to exploit that. Um, the next thing is about having secure connections. So if you are running, uh, if you're still running HTTP connections to your web services or, or server, make sure you switch it over to HTTPS. Um, there's a really nice tool for testing our securing network connections called Charles Proxy. Uh, so Charles Proxy is, a, is, a, is an app, so when you set it up, it acts as the middle person um, between your app and any external or web services that your app connects to. Um, it's quite scary when you first run it because it, if you set it up, it'll, it'll um, tap into all the connections um, between your device and, and the internet and it can show you all the content of your request and the response you get from the server. So uh, knowing this, so if your app sort of is transmitting any kind of uh, sensitive information, um, you wanna make sure that you either sort of have it encrypted or you wanna make sure that even someone gets hold of this information, uh, there's no easy way for them to exploit this. Uh, Louis, uh, who just presented in this room uh, before me, he, had as a, he has a really uh, good talk about mobile app security called 2017 State of Mobile App Security. Um, he did that last year, uh, during last year's DevWall. Um, I've included a link to that talk here, so if you're really interested to know and learn more about mobile app security and just to see the kind of tool that attackers um, have these days to, uh, to attack apps, um, that's, a, that's a really fascinating talk to, uh, to check out. So, uh, you know, incubation, 10 months later, right? And um, the app is, uh, uh, I haven't got the speaker connected, but you know, the app, the app works and um, we felt like the app is kind of ready for launch. Um, but actually, um, what we, uh, what, we, what we discover actually two weeks before the launch is uh, we have a potential problem with scaling, right? So just to, just to give you a little bit of um, context uh, into this issue that we discover. Um, so New South Wales has about 1.2 million new learners every year. Um, so we're, we're making the, the best case scenario assumptions here. So assuming that we have a third of the market share uh, because there are three officially recognized apps at the moment. Uh, so that gives us probably about 400,000 users. And so you would think for a, you know, a 
a digital logbook, a lot of the data that we're dealing with are just text, right? You store a lot of um, these things in text. They're usually pretty small to store and pretty small to transfer. So there shouldn't be any big sort of, sort of scaling issue. However, there's one piece of information in the app that's not a text. So uh, it's signatures. So in the app, um, whenever the learner completes a trip, uh, it needs to be signed off by the supervisor or the instructor. And every time when they complete like a learning goal, it has to be signed off as well with a, with a signature. Um, so the signature after being resized and being turned into a, a monochrome image, it's about two kilobyte per signature. That plus the, all that you know, user profile um, information, which is text-based, is about 300 kilobyte. Um, these needs to be sent across to the server, and it gets stored uh, in probably about 145 verification sessions. So every time there's a signature or when it, every time a sign-off happened, um, there's a verification uh, that needs to be done. So that uh, accounts to about 21 megabyte transfer uh, per user. 21, 21 megabyte itself doesn't sound like a lot, but if you multiply that by you know, the, the amount of users that we may possibly get, um, it's a lot. And we sort of punch the numbers into the cost calculator in the, in the back end that we use, Firebase. It comes to about $1,400 every month. And this is a lot of money for us. And we were not ready to, uh, to spend this much money. We don't really have that much money to spend on, on um, storage and the bandwidth. So this is a true story. We had this discussion last year, the night uh, after we uh, came back to the hotel from Devo dinner. All right, best time to have a chat after, after you have a couple of glasses of wine. And so uh, we have this problem now. And uh, our chief designer in chief, Zach, he's a, he's a designer. So he decided that that's enough. I'm not really going to. There's not much I could do, so he just like, I'm going to take a photo of you, you keep working, and I'm going to sleep. <laughs> and, so, and so I started working on a solution to the problem. Uh, so, what, uh, so what we did is, it's about two weeks away from lunch, and so, you know, embracing limitation. That's what I learned from the keynote. Um, so we had a storage model re-architecture. So what uh, we ended up doing is uh, we decouple the storage of the signatures and the user data. So we use Firebase as our, as, as our backend. And um, initially, so all the user data and the signatures are stored in the real-time database. Uh, real-time database is great. It has a lot of like, neat features for developers, really developer-friendly. So it's really easy to do real-time syncing, and you get the benefit of um, you know, a daily backups. Um, it's really easy to integrate that into your code. It handles all that networking connection for you. Um, so it's really good, but it's also really expensive if your data starts to get big. So um, what we did is then we split it up. Uh, we keep the user data in the real-time database. So we minimize the changes we need to do um, to handle that. And we move all the storage for uh, the signature files into another service provided by Firebase called Firebase Storage. Uh, so Firebase Storage is it's a, it's a service designed to sort of store and um, distribute larger files. And it lacks all that feature you get from a real-time database. So you don't get real-time syncing. Uh, you have to do your um, uploads and downloads manually. There's no automated backups for these files. But it does make storing these files really, really cheap. Um, so uh, we adopted that. So we use that in addition to the real-time database. We split it up. Uh, the signature images are pretty good in a way that uh, we only need it for archival purposes for, uh, for auditing by the transport department later on. So as soon as the signature is done on the, on the phone, we just kind of uh, upload it onto our Firebase storage. 
and it just kind of stays there and doesn't get uh, move around after much. So uh, that fits what Firebase storage um, uh, model really well. And by just doing that, we managed to reduce the estimated cost for about 400,000 users down to $6.11 uh, $6 per month. So that's a more manageable cost for us, right? But, but honestly, we didn't really hit anywhere near this amount of usage um, after the launch. But um, it's good to know that if we got to that number, you know, it's not going to run the company down before we start making any money from it. Um, so the so lesson that we learned from scaling is um, uh, you got to be, be aware and be prepared of potential scaling costs. So the reason why this didn't really, we didn't really talk or we didn't really uh, you know, get into or think about the problem with this is we did, uh, we did a research before we started developing it. The you know, reason why we picked Firebase is because we don't really want to deal with scaling. And it's great. It allows us to do that. But we didn't know how much it's going to cost us, which is um, something that, um, that only hits us about two weeks before launch. And the surprising thing, at least for us during the time, was like the cost of hosting a popular service or an app. It's not really about the storage too much, but it's, it's the bandwidth. So as your, as your user, you know, as you get more and more user, um, it's important to think about how that large number of user kind of changes the, the equation of, of transferring files and storing files um, of your service. Um, the other thing that uh, we learn as well as part of this whole thing is um, the trap of, of inf infrastructure lock-in. Um, so what we meant by that is um, if you rely on a backend, and for us it's, it's Firebase, um, you kind of have to be prepared um, that you know one or think about the situation where one day if if Firebase sort of decided to close shop um, How are you going to handle that situation? Is it possible for you to migrate all your data to a different service? And is and if so how easy it is to do that? All right, so um, You don't really have to start sort of developing a whole bunch of migration tools and process yet but just bear that in mind when you're designing your system so that it is possible to do it when you need to do it. And, um, and I guess our story from, you know, from doing that last minute architecture change is you got to make sure you pick the right tool for the, for the job. So um, have a look around. Um, think about all the different options you have. Um, make sure you pick the right job. Usually when it's too expensive or when it's taking you too much time, it's probably not the solution that you need. So with that fix, the app is finally launched, right? So, uh, so now I'm going to move on and talk about uh, the lessons that we learned after the launch. So remember uh, I said after, after the big incubation process, the department sort of include us into a uh, big sort of marketing push where they've organized like a new segment that features um, all the apps that went through the, the incubation program. You would think that's a, that's a really good coverage for uh, you know, a small company like us where we don't really have a lot of budget for, for marketing. Um, but just to show you the kind of curveballs that you can get even with such a big sort of uh, marketing push, I'll show you what, uh, this, is, this is what gets shown on the, on the, on the new segment. The digital platform is made up of three new apps, replacing the old logbook. License Ready, Round Trip and L2P, all three are free and recognised by the RMS. As well as logging hours into the apps, they also feature GPS tracking, automated weather conditions and video learning content. Um, sorry about the resolution, it's, it's the best one I can find. Um, so anyone notice what went wrong with the, with the new segment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, the, I, I don't know uh, which, whose, whose fault it is, but the result is they swap our icon with our app name. So now we have a whole bunch of confused users who are either looking for our competitor's app or looking for our app, and then they, they just don't know which app to use. And so this is a, this is a really tricky situation for us. And uh, the, the lesson or the way that we got around that or we're, we're trying to resolve that is by putting in search ad. 
Um, so search ad, um, if you're not aware of it, is, um, it's a, it works a little bit like Google's AdWord, but in the App Store. So you can bid for certain search terms or keywords, and um, your, your app will get shown in a, in a banner, uh, which is like one of the first thing that comes up when a user search for that term. And so we, we sort of counter that confusion by bidding for our own app name and all of our competitors' app name. So um, when they try to search for either our name or the competitor's name, uh, we will at least have a chance to be displayed. Uh, and hopefully, you know, by our description and our screenshots is able to convince them that they'll happy to give our app a try. Uh, and then there's the usual, you know, uh, having a social media presence, making it easier for people to ask you questions or you can respond to users' sort of inquiries on social media. Um, Zach does a lot of that. I, I sort of hand it off to him. Um, the other interesting thing that we found uh, while we're working on, on getting our app name out there is um, getting buy-in from surrounding network. So what we mean by surrounding network is, um, in our case, our intended users are these learners. Right? We designed the app to be used by the learners, um, but they rely a lot on the people surrounding them, especially uh, people like their parents as the supervisors and driving instructors. So um, what we found is um, they become someone who is really valuable to talk to uh, or to, to get our names known by. So once um, the parents know about our app or instructors uh, know about our app and if they're familiar with our app, they're more likely to recommend it to learners um, if learners come to them for advice. So this may not apply to your app, but this is something that's worth thinking about as well. Um, next thing is um, having a delightful user experience. So um, James did a talk yesterday, which is really good, where he talked about having that emotional connection with your user. Right? So what I mean by having a delightful user experience here, it's um, whenever appropriate in your app, try to include some kind of whimsical touches of delight um, in your app. Uh, what they did, well, so what, what we found is they become a really good talking point when you need to market your app and for your users to spread it um, to their friends. You know, they become a really good uh, way to, to spread your app through the words of mouth. So just to give you some examples, um, in our app, um, so the first example is uh, the background when you're running the recording view, uh, it changes according to the time of the day. All right. And the second one is as you're taking off the learning goals, it has this nice sort of pop animation, um, just makes it really satisfying to complete learning goals. And lo this last one is my favorite. So you have this L plate that swings um, according to your phone's sort of gyroscope um, reading. It's completely useless, right? It uh, took, took me a week to program that. Um, but it's, it's a really good talking point for the app, right? We're, not, we're known as the app with the swinging L plate. That's how they, they, uh, they recognize our app. Okay. All right, I'll try to um, finish quickly. Okay, so the other thing that we found during, um, after launch is, um, Handling support emails, oh man, I did not expect it. Um, they, we got so much support emails, uh, and they're usually from users who are confused with certain part of our app, or if they've, um, if they've did something wrong um, that they, they, they can't figure out why. So uh, when you're designing your app, this is another sort of perspective you can think about as well, is just try and make sure that the interface is really uh, not uh, make it easy for them not to be uh, confusing or make it really hard for them to make mistake. So our example is we initially when we designed the user sign up screen we, we had one email field and one password. We want to make it super easy. They type it once, they sign up, you know, this life's too short for typing email twice. But a lot, a lot of our users made a typo when they sign up and that made it impossible for them to reset their password and it made it really hard for them to, uh, to lock back into the, the app again if they accidentally locked out, for example. 
So uh, we, we had so much support email for this that we had to sort of uh, create a whole process for migrating user across to the, the real actual email address. And so in the end, what we did is in the next update, we added another email confirmation field. So uh, you know, this reduces so much of our email um, and uh, it also makes our user happier because they don't have to go through that pain of emailing us again just to get support. So this is another perspective to think about. Um, I'll skip through this um, because I have one more story to tell you. So uh, the last lesson that I want to tell you is about Trademark. So this happens two months before launch. Um, trademark is something very businessy, and uh, I usually try to procrastinate as much as I can with business tasks. And it has finally come to time where I need to register trademark for our app. So I jump on IP Australia. This is where you go through to find to register your trademark and do a whole bunch of trademark related things. I search for uh, the name of our app. It used to be called Learner Journey, and you'll know why why it got changed. So it it happens that the name has already been registered. So I turned to Zach and I said. Dude, you've already done this. This, I, I, that's great. You're on top of everything, and this is when Zach turned around and he showed me the face. Wait. So yeah, he said, "What do you mean? I haven't done anything." And so what basically happened is one of our competitor actually went in and registered our app name um, for us, well under their name. So. <laughs> So yeah, so this is a really uh, this is a disaster moment for us. Like so, luckily we had, we found out like two months before we launched. So that sort of gave us enough time to sort of go through and change our app name, change all our marketing materials, just to make sure that you know um, uh, we we are able to launch in time. Yeah. Um, so lesson: make sure you register your trademark as soon as you you've decided on the name. Um, also, a quick tip is check your domain name uh, when you're deciding names because they're really hard to get hold on. All right, so a summary of, of um, all the lessons that I learned, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you.